This is Robert Kraft, and I'm your host on SNN Network. And joining me right now is Dr. Mark Hedrick. He is the CEO of Plus Therapeutics. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is PSTV on NASDAQ. Dr. Hedrick, thank you for joining me today. Hey, Robert. Good afternoon. Nice to talk to you. So I have to ask before we get into more, more questions about the company, how are you holding up? How's everything going? Everybody safe and sound? Yeah, no, great. Uh, we, the bandwidth is holding out. My son from New York is here working, and my, my daughter and son-in-law from D.C. are here working. So uh, as long as the bandwidth holds out, we're good. Very good. Yeah, the, you got the whole crew on the farm there. We do. We got the whole crew on the farm. <laughs> All right, I love it. Well, let's get into Plus Therapeutics. Uh, I want to start off with a quick overview and history of the company, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, there, there's a lot of history, and I think the best thing to do is just focus on 2019, which was a uh, major refocusing and transitional year for the company. We actually uh, strategically divested some key legacy assets and that provided some, some capital. So work with a board chair or management team and we, we really reinvented or reimagined the company uh, to our strong suits, which are a rare cancer focused company. Um, we felt like that's where we could make the greatest difference and that's where our, our greatest opportunities lay. So we, as part of that, we adopted a very capital efficient development or operating model. And we took the technology in a direction that best fit with our core expertise and took full advantage of our IP. And then finally, we decided to do it in Texas. And Texas, as you may or may not know, is the number two cancer funder in the world behind the National Cancer Institute. Got it. So, you know, t tell me what, what makes the company then and, and the science unique and different compared to your peers out there? You know, how, how are you approaching the rare cancer uh, space? Yeah, you know, I think uh, it's, it's uh, let me be, let me be narrow and focused on that answer, which will, I think, paint the bigger picture. So if you look at our lead drug for brain cancer called RNL, it's a very unique uh, compound. It's it's a, it's a patented technology that's got a great academic pedigree. And actually the key component of the technology is made in a nuclear reactor, believe it or not. Um, we're now in a phase one dose finding trial, but that trial is funded through phase two by the NIH or the National Cancer Institute. And the key part of that unique technology is it delivers the best cancer killer to tumors that you can have, which is radiation. But right now, in our dose escalation trial, we're already up to 15 times the amount of radiation that regular external beam irradiation can do, which is the mainstay for brain cancer. So that unique therapy uh, could be potentially important for brain cancer, which is our first indication, but also other rare cancers as well. Got it. So this actually leads to my next question. And um, you, you describe this, uh, and I quote, a platform built for scale, end quote, uh, I believe in a, in a release not that long ago, yep. you know, that, that can advance the development of multiple drugs over time. So can you, you kind of alluded to it already, like I said, you know, yeah. uh, can you describe the platform a little bit more and, and how you plan on a, uh, your vision for maximizing it? You know, um, Kind of divided into two. So there are two aspects of the platform. One is the technology and one is the operating model because they, they both sort of fit together. From the, from the technology perspective, we have this nanoparticle envelope, enveloping technology. And if you think about a biological envelope, that's sort of like a, uh, the, the outer layer of a cell. Inside, we can put very nasty payloads. And those Payloads are nasty because they're really good at killing cancer cells. On the outside of the envelope, we can put addresses or addressing signals that allow the drug to get to the target, more specifically deliver the payload, but also protect the normal cells and tissues of the body. So that's, the, that's part of the platform. The other part of the platform is the operating model. And I sort of alluded to that, uh, to that a moment ago. Um, and you and I discussed this earlier. Our executive team lives in three different time zones. I live here on a farm in, in Virginia, but I'm in Austin and Texas three out of four weeks a year. And so we have an executive team that works virtually. Even before COVID, we, we work virtually. That's part of our model. Um, 
but we also have a central manufacturing and R&D team that's in Texas. And in that, we have a 10,000 square foot commercial scale uh, manufacturing facility that also does R&D. So we have this core fully capitalized facility that gives us a lot of flexibility, but we have sort of a, a, a very um, uh, talented executive team that lives all over. When we meet in Texas periodically to, 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 to move the company forward. And I mentioned Texas before, but you know, I, I mentioned that it's cancer funding, but it's has been one of the strongest economies in the state. I think that'll continue. And it has four National Cancer Institute cancer centers, as well as being the largest funder of cancer research in the world behind the NIH, by virtue of its CIPRIT, C-P-R-I-T, Cancer Prevention uh, and Research Institute of Texas. So there's a lot of reasons why Texas is a, is a great place for us. Got it. So, you know, I, I have to ask because, you know, you're dealing with rare cancers and specifically in the brain right now, you know, that's prob that, that right there. I mean, I've done a number of interviews with companies that are working on therapeutics trying to cross the blood brain brain barrier. Right. You know, there it it is. It's whew, it it's hard. And 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 even saying that, it, it seems like I'm saying it lightly, right? You know. So yeah. So you guys, you know, for all intents and purposes, you're a smaller company. You know, nano cap company. You know, what what separates you and what makes you feel that you know, you as a company can take it to that next step? You know, do we have some data readouts that are coming up soon? You know, what, what, what are some of the things coming up that investors should look for that, you know, can explain, you know, you guys taking it over that hump and taking it to the next step? Yeah, you know, um, we, the, 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 the brain cancer technology is actually something that we recently in license. And it, um, we, we looked at it, 30 different opportunities in terms of building out our pipeline, which is an important strategic priority for us. I, I fell in love with this, A, because it sort of leveraged our core strengths in, in nanoparticle technology, but also there was no question about mechanism of action. We know that high energy electrons kill rapidly dividing cells. So there, there was no issue about mechanism. There was no issue uh, that we saw about safety uh, and with respect to glioblastoma, radiation kills glioblastoma cells. The question for us is, could we deploy this across the blood-brain barrier, as you mentioned, in a reliable way and get, get, um, get radiation on tumor for a long period of time? And, and we convince ourselves that we think we can do it. The tech, this is a very complicated, high-tech treatment. The, the therapeutic is high-tech and the delivery is high tech and the imaging is high tech. But all of those technologies have risen to a level of technical proficiency that we think it's time now that we can put something together and be the first approved drug for recurrent glioblastoma in the last 10 years. I was just gonna say, you know, I, I've, we've talked this whole time, we haven't talked about the initial indication. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. So yeah. glioblastoma, just for those who don't know, um, what's what's the size of this patient uh, uh, community or population right now? You know, it's it's, it's technically a rare disease. It's you know it's about twelve thousand or so patients uh, in the U.S. every year. Um, but it's it's one of those drugs that it's rare, but it's not so rare that almost everyone I've talked to knows of a friend or a friend of a friend, family member, somebody that's actually had it. So, and when you have it, you know it's 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 very serious. I mean, it's even be, been called a death sentence. There's just no good treatments and it's a terrible diagnosis to have. And the, uh, once, it, it all, once you get it, there's some treatments, but it almost always recurs. And once it recurs, you have about six to nine months to live. Um, and so new treatments for this are critical to making an impact to these patients. All right, so you, you noted on your recent earnings call uh, that your pipeline now includes drug candidates that could, and I quote, redefine the way we treat brain tumors, end quote. You know, can you describe some of these drugs? Yeah, so, you know, I kind of go back to this original um, uh, in licensing transaction that we frankly just closed uh, within the last couple of weeks. So we were we we have two clinical we had two clinical stage assets now we have three the third is this new RNL drug that I mentioned for glioblastoma but we we looked for 
portfolios of drugs that we can bring in relatively easily. In this case, we acquired the asset for approximately $400,000 in cash and, and $300,000 in stock and, and earnout. So it was very back end loaded transaction. But the thing about this asset that we really liked is it's pre-funded. In other words, the phase one and phase two trial are already funded by the National Cancer Institute. So good pedigree, good existing support for the technology. So really it's, they've provided some, some financial wiggle room, if you, if you will, for us to take this core asset and develop for other cancers. And so there's a number of preclinical studies that have already been done with this cancer, with this treatment for cancers like leptomeningeal carcinoma, big words, don't have time to explain it, uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis, recurrent head and neck cancer, uh, very bad breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and so forth. So the, the platform came with a funded, pre-funded, if you will, key asset or lead asset and a number of other opportunities. And then the financial structuring around it allowed us to pour money into those and develop those and get those into the clinic. Got it. So I, I also have to ask, you know, from what you can tell us, what, what developments should investors be alert for in 2020 and beyond? So, um, well, I, you may have heard this, but there, there's, sort of, uh, there's sort of five Ds in, in biotechnology from an in, in investor perspective. There's the diseases, the drugs, the data, the deals, and the dilution. So let me just tackle each of those five really quickly. So in terms of diseases and drugs, I mentioned we've got three clinical strains, drugs, with some new opportunities on the way, plus our lead asset for glioblastoma. So we're continuing to look in a disciplined way for other opportunities. We hope to have data this year. So we hope to have our phase one data later this year. COVID issues aside, we hope we can get uh, that trial enrolled. We're bringing on UT Southwestern, my alma mater, and hopefully MD Anderson and Houston pretty quick to help us support enrollment of that trial. In terms of deals, uh, we're actively looking for out licensing partners for our three clinical stage assets, in particular outside the US for the RNL portfolio. Um, and then we're aggressively, but you know, I, as I mentioned, disciplined fashion, looking for ways to continue to build out uh, our, our pipeline. And then dilution. I know a lot of people think about that, but you know, based on the hard choices we made and raising almost $30 million last year and putting ourselves in a, a much better financial position. Uh, we're really in a good position as it relates to cash and cash burn right now. And as I mentioned, it helps if your lead asset is funded uh, to phase two by, by a third party, the NIH. Got it. All right. So from there, where can my audience go and find everything they need to know about Plus Therapeutics uh, to follow along on the progress uh, as, as more news comes out? Well, you know, the, the, the typical channels, plustherapeutics.com. Uh, we're also active on um, Twitter, social media, stock twits, LinkedIn. We're actually looking at some new interesting opportunities that have come up, probably COVID related, frankly, but stay tuned. There's some new ways I think we can communicate better to our shareholders and prospective shareholders to get the story out. But you know, worse comes to worse, call me, call some of our executive team. We're happy, we're excited about what we're doing. And we're happy to tell, tell anybody about what we're doing and give as much information as we can. And with that, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this and also participating in our virtual event that we just had. Good luck, stay safe, and uh, I look forward to our next update. You too. Thanks. Take, thanks, for, thanks for everything. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye.